Hello, everyone. For those who I haven't met, my name is Puri Bandari, and I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for Erase HIV. I work at Sister Love, which is a reproductive health and justice nonprofit here in Atlanta, Georgia, aimed at eradicating the adverse impacts of HIV and sexual and reproductive health rights and justice challenges that impact women and their families. So we're honored to serve as community partner for the Erase HIV team and work together to hold conversations and events just like this. So Mirko Pyardini and Diana Culpa, who are the researchers for Erase, will be talking a bit more about HIV cure research, Erase's work specifically, and then also the importance of non-human primate cure research. <clears throat> and we'll have time, sorry. <clears throat> we'll have time afterwards for a quick Q&A. But also feel free to raise your hand during the call or, you know, type any questions or clarifications you have at any point. So before we get started, I'm just going to send out a quick two question poll just to gauge how familiar everyone is with cure research and specifically non-human primary research. Okay, so I'll give everyone just a quick second to answer that. Great. And with that, I will turn it over to Mirko and Deanna. If you want to just briefly introduce yourselves and then start, I will. I think you should have sharing access and then I'll kind of spot, spotlight you as well, but go ahead. Perfect. Th thank you, Pari, and uh, thank you to everyone to, to join this call. I am uh, uh, Mirko Perdini. I'm professor of pathology at the School of Medicine at Temer University, and I'm also a division chief of microbiology immunology at the Emory Primate Research Center, where we conduct our non human primate research, and I am one of the principal investigators of Ferese HIV with Diana. Uh, hello, my name is Diana Culpa. I'm also in the Division of Microbiology and Immunology here at the Primate Center. I am an associate professor in the Department of Pathology in Emory School of Medicine, and I'm also one of the principal investigators for Erase HIV. And our focus is on HIV cure research, uh, mechanisms of HIV resistance during therapy, and immune modulation and studies of interventions for immune modulation. I put together a few slides. I don't know if but you want me already to, to, to go start describing it, but I put together a few slides that describe a little bit of background of the importance of the non-human primate model for a HIV research in general, for HIV cure research in particular. And then I will have some of the uh, some example of the specific research we are doing as part of RHCV, why we are excited about the data we are generating, and what are the challenges that we still need, need to solve. Just as an initial introduction, antiretroviral therapy for people living with HIV has been really a, one of the most, most important results of medicine. People now with antiretroviral therapy is able to control the very large majority of people at a very low to undetectable level. The introduction of heart has significantly dramatically reduced morbidity and mortality for people living with HIV. So this is a fantastic result obtained by uh, research and by medicine. But there are still two important challenges uh, despite this uh, highly successful antiretroviral therapy. So, and of course, in addition to people that don't have access or don't take antiretroviral therapy. Even the person that take it are fully suppressed, there is two important challenges. So one is that uh, antiretroviral therapy does not fully eliminate what is called immune inflammation. So there is damage to the immune system that has been generated for a uh, living for several years with this virus. This is particularly true for people that did not start antiretroviral therapy uh, early after acquisition. And this residual inflammation has been shown that is associated with multiple uh, diseases that are called non-AIDS related disease because they're not just directly driven by the virus, but by the inflammation induced from the immune system responding to the virus. And this is what still contributes to having a short lifespan for people living with HIV than the normal population. The other main uh, challenge is that Despite the ability of antiretroviral therapy to block the replication of the virus, in the very large majority of people, if they stop antiretroviral therapy, as you can see in this cartoon, the virus come back to level very similar to those before antiretroviral therapy. 
And this is because HIV hiding uh, uh, some cells in our body that are called the reservoir for the virus. And antiretroviral therapy is not able to eliminate these cells. There's been a lot of hope that when antiretroviral therapy was becoming very long, right, people that was treated for 20 years, 30 years, maybe if you stop R, the virus will not come back. There's been a lot of hope if you start antiretroviral therapy very early on, the virus will not come back. But unfortunately, in the very large majority of people, the virus come back. Having said that, I want to stress that starting art early on as soon as possible is really beneficial, both to reduce the inflammation that I just discussed and also to help having a lower reservoir. So with that, this is the, the big challenge. So why we are not been able yet to having a cure for HIV? Because as I said, the virus hide inside cells. And as you can see in this cartoon, there is many tissue, many sites in our body in which the virus is present despite antiretroviral therapy. This goes from the gut tissue, lymph nodes, spleen, liver, the nervous system, etc. And the virus can be found in multiple cells of the immune system that are present in this tissue. So it's really a remarkable complexity of the uh, nature of the HIV reservoir that we need to, to attack and to solve. Mm -hmm. The other point that we are focused that is shown in this overlapping circle is that, as I said, there is not only the virus that persists, but there is also immune dysfunction. Uh, so hopefully one day, if we have a cure that eliminated the last copy of the virus, in, in our opinion, to be a real cure, we also need to be sure that we also cure the immune dysfunction. It's not sufficient to eliminate the last copy of the virus if the defect on the immune system that impact on the overall life of a person are still there. So this is our approach, try to both reduce the virus and inflammation associated with it. So, uh, and this is basically the approach that we've been uh, following in many this year with my work, Diana work, with the Sylvester work and other in the laboratory. So we really focus on trying to define mechanisms that are responsible for the inflammation and for the virus to persist, understanding which cells the virus persists and what persists for so long time. And then we design, taking advantage of the new primate model, intervention specific for this mechanism. So if the mechanism A is critical for the persistence of the virus, can we target mechanism A blocking it? And indeed, are we improving or not? Uh, the, the, are we reducing or not the persistence of the virus? And as you see by this arrow, then, of course, not always what we hypothesize is right. Then we come back and further understand from our intervention and try to further define a more specific way to eliminate the reservoir. And this cartoon summarizes many of the interventions that the field has been <clears throat> testing and is currently testing. And the hope is that we'll be able to have an intervention or a combination of intervention that will block the virus to rebound or even if the virus to rebound the immune system will be able to control it. So people can stop antiretroviral therapy and they remain undetectable. As I said, we work at the non-human primate center. So a, a lot of our research involved non-human primate. Diana is part of the laboratory, does also a significant amount of research on uh, sample from people living with HIV and also in vitro uh, using cells. Uh, we do a lot of work using the non-human primate model. And I want to highlight in this cartoon that uh, yeah, we use the Riz macaques. So this is an Indian uh, species. We use a very close relative of HIV. This is called, we call the cousin of HIV, HIV mac. That is the virus that uh, infect the monkey. Uh, for example, uh, that we can infect the monkey. This is really very similar to, to HIV. And this is a cartoon just to show that what we've been able to show in on human primate is that they really mimic what happens in, in people living with HIV. When we experimentally infect one animal, we do see high viral load uh, in the acute phase of infection. Then the viral load remain uh, higher and there is damage to the immune system. Then if we start antiretroviral therapy, as in, in people living with HIV, we are able to fully block the replication of the virus. And I did not show here, we'll show in the next cartoon, but if we stop antiretroviral therapy, also in macaques, very large majority of them, the virus rebound. So this is considered a 
not only the best model for HIV cure, for actually for HIV in general, but the non-human primate model is macaques is considered the best animal model thing ever for medicine in general. It's really capitulating very similarly what happened to people in with HIV. So the advantage of using a non-human primate model is that we can, of course, do a, a more experimental intervention that may be associated with risks. Of course, you want tested in a preclinical model before. And we also can do a lot of longitudinal collection to better understand where the virus is, how we can target it. And the, as I shown the cartoon before, the virus hides in many organs in our say, immune, in our body. So the advantage of the non-human primate is that we can also collect multiple tissue including lymph node, gut tissue, bone marrow, longitudinally, and we can also collect, for example, brain or other site uh, when we sacrifice the animal. So this really inform a lot on where the virus is and how we can target it. And as I said, the Rizumacast model has been used for many questions uh, for HIV, including pathogenesis, prevention, transmission, vaccine, etc. And more recently, is ably used for uh, study aim to uh, eliminate the virus or even if the virus is in the immune, still in the immune system uh, to control the virus without antiretroviral therapy. And this is the area that we are really more focused. And I'm going to give you uh, some of the example of our strategy and what we've been doing. So there is two main uh, intervention phase that us and the field in general are very interested. One is to have intervention at the uh, initiation of antiretroviral therapy. So this is the advantage in a way that we can try to uh, reduce the cells in which the virus is hiding. So if we do that at the beginning of antiretroviral therapy, the hope is that those cells will not become the reservoir that survive for many years. And so if we stop antiretroviral therapy, there is much less virus around. So this is, a, 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 I think, a strategy that has the most chance to work right now, of course, will not impact people that are already on long-term antiretroviral therapy, but if we found a, a way to block the reservoir right away, what we call the establishment of the reservoir, this can be adapted to people that will basically new diagnosis that will need to start antiretroviral therapy. Let me just uh, interrupt with a question in the chat very quickly. Question is how, if data is promising in the macaque models, how long until it gets to humans? Yeah, so I, I have some uh, a point of discussion at the end on this. It really depend on the, I'm talking about efficacy. The other key point, as you will see from our study, is safety, right? So we do have some interventions that actually have been proved to be very effective. I think one of the most effective there is in the field right now but unfortunately are associated with toxicity. So that has a big impact on when you can translate to, to, to human. And I will come back to this later on and in the discussion, but that is a key point to, to address. Thanks for the question. So the other, the other phase in which a, a lot of, of work is focused, and this will involve uh, everybody living with HIV that is on long-term antiretroviral therapy, is okay, we are not going to intervene at heart initiation, this non-human primate or people are already on antiretroviral therapy since a long time. And so the reservoir is already big, but we can potentially design intervention that make our immune system stronger. So when we block antiretroviral therapy, we will be able to control the rebound of the virus. So similar to what is happening on cancer, try to train the immune system to kill cancer cells. In the past, it was only chemotherapy. Now there is a lot of what are called immunobased intervention. We train our system to recognize the cancer cells and kill them. Here is a similar concept. Can we train the immune system to recognize the cells infected with the virus and eliminate them without the need of antiretroviral therapy? So with that, I'm going to make Two example, I make it short and try to make it sim uh, simple. And if there is question, please let me know or stop me. So one thing we've been very interesting is uh, our cells that is infected with HIV survive. So there's been a lot of studies showing that when the virus enters CD40 cells, the main target for HIV, CD40 cells, the very large majority of them, 
die for two mechanisms. One is that we have cells called CD80 cells that are specific in our immune system to recognize and infect the cells and kill it. So the CD80 cells should recognize, recognize a lot of the HIV infected cells and kill them. This is why there is a also immunocompromised, right? Because people that have this virus have CD4 uh, killed both by the immune system and both by the virus if they don't have antiretroviral therapy. The other mechanism is exactly what I just said. The virus is a cytopathic virus that can kill the cells that the, the virus enter. So there's been now very recent data showing that uh, some of the CD4 that express high level of a protein called the BCL2, even if they are infected, they survive. They can survive for a long time. And so these are the cells that have the highest chance to become the reservoir because the virus is inside them. The immune system cannot see it cannot kill that cells, and these cells survive for a long time. So if you stop art, now these cells have virus that can come back. And the BCL2 has been shown to protect from both mechanisms of killing, both from the CD80 cells and also from the ability of the virus to kill the cells that are infected. So there is a, a, we hypothesize that if we can now target this BCL2, this is a protein that basically favors the survival of cells, and there's an important role also in cancer. So if we can now block this protein BCL2 that favor the survival of the cells, can we specifically induce cell death, killing the cells in which the virus hides, so reducing the reservoir? And uh, the, what we've been doing, what we are doing, this is an ongoing study, we use a, a medicine called venetoclax, a compound called venetoclax, that is actually approved for cancer. As I said, as you know, cancer cells keep growing. They have mechanisms that uh, protect them from cell death. Uh, and one of these key mechanisms in cancer is these cancer cells have high level of this protein they favor survival. So there's been a lot of study to try to reduce BCL2. So venetoclax is approved for this cancer listed here. It's associated with uh, a common adverse event that you also see here with neutropenia and nausea, the most uh, frequent. There is a strong belief in the field that these side effects are largely related to the condition of those cancer that are a very ad a advanced cancer for people that use venetoclax. And there is belief that the side effect will be lower in a more normal immune system for people that are on long-term antiretroviral therapy. Indeed, there is a planning for a clinical trial with the two main sites in Denmark and also in Australia, in which uh, they're going to uh, recruit participants that are people uh, living with HIV and radion antiretroviral therapy, in which venetoclax will be administered. So try to address the question, can we block this pro-survival protein and eliminate the reservoir? So since this trial will start soon, uh, they're supposed to start recruitment for last time I had in the next two to four weeks, we really a few months ago decided to uh, start a study in macaques to really understand better uh, how this works and if it's really going to potentially have an effect. So one thing that I want to uh, explain briefly is why this venetoclax we expect to be effective and working. So as I said, the BCL2 is this pro-survival protein. What she does, she binds two other protein they're called BIM and Bax, but the name is not important. This protein favors the killing of the cells. So BCL2 binds this protein, does not, does not allow them to go to the mitochondria and to basically start part to the kill cells. So venetoclax now mimic exactly the site where the BCL2 bind those two proteins. So if you now have venetoclax, here shown in green, venetoclax will bind in that site. So BCL2 cannot longer bind this two protein. They can be released to the mitochondria and now they can induce the apoptosis, yeah, the killing of the infected cells. So this is the overall idea behind this mechanism, both in cancer and now we are trying to adapt for, HA, for uh, people living with HIV. Uh, Mirko, we have one more question in the yeah. chat. Um, what will the side effects be in using this method in humans or is it too early to know? Yes, so in human with cancer is well known and the majority are this one listed here because it's been used now for several years. 
and these people take this drug daily for, for many days. And is associated with a very significant uh, beneficial uh, turnout in, in cancer. In human, has not, has not been, in people living with HIV, has not been administered. This will be the first clinical trial, and our is the first monkey study to, to, show, to show this. So it's not known. The expectations that is going to be uh, much safer than in cancer, of course, it need to be proved. And uh, in uh, people living with HIV, what is going to happen is that I'm not involved in a clinical trial, but what is going to happen is that they will start with lower dose. And then if it's safe, they were escalated to arrive to those that are used for, for cancer. And then one more question. How yeah. long have you been working on this research? So these studies, we started basically two and a half years ago because it's more than one year long study. And that will actually show right now, I think, this study design. Yeah. So this is exactly what, what we did. So we have 24 animals. And uh, the studies, uh, we for now completed the study in 12 animals, and we have had up 12 that is ongoing. Uh, so as you always need, you need to have a control group, right, to prove that your intervention is working. So do not focus on R number three. is for a more complicated uh, design and question that uh, uh, I think is out of the scope of today call. But... If you focus on the first two group, what we are doing, we are infecting the animal at day zero. So we are giving the virus to the animal. We wait two weeks. So we are sure that the infection is in place. There is some damage to the immune system. So this mimic the early antiretroviral therapy in people living with HIV. And then when we give art, one group only receive antiretroviral therapy, as will be in people living with HIV. And we follow them for uh, almost one year. And in one group, we give 10 doses of this drug, Venetoclax, once a day from Monday to Friday, break on the weekend, and then again from Monday to Friday. So very short dosage. In people with cancer, use much longer. We won't just start to see there is an impact, it's safe, and if this is there is an impact, can we treat longer? So uh, as I said, the advantage of the non-human primate model is that we exactly know when we infected the animal, we exactly know when uh, we are at day 14 post-infection, right? So we can really standardize for many parameters that are variable and can impact on the result of a study in human. And we can collect a lot of samples at key time point. So we have been collected, as you can see here, for example, blood, lymphoid tissue, a lymph node biopsy, a gut biopsy, before we start the intervention, to be sure what was the level of the reservoir, and then immediately after the 10 days to be sure how did we impact it on that. So not only we can compare between a control group and the group that received the medicine, but also we can compare before, before and just immediately after. So this is the first question. Did we change the size of the reservoir, right? But then what is important, if we change the size of the reservoir, but then the reservoir come back because we stopped treating, is a, a no-go, right? So the other question is, is this effect long-lasting? So again, we can come back to our animal a few months later, six months later, 10 months later, and see if the reservoir reconstitute or if we reduce it to remain lower. We have another question. Um, yeah. how, many, how many fatalities have happened using these primate models? Uh, how many fatalities, you said? Mm -hmm. So for, for this study, uh, nothing. So... What happened in this study is that we give the, uh, so venetoclax is new one is a pill. Uh, in macaques, it's very difficult to give pill. The animals are very smart, and even if you put in uh, food, and we try every kind of food, I'm Italian, I also try Nutella, nothing work. Like they basically uh, chew everything around and then split the pill. So we give by a subcutane injection, and uh, there was a, a side effect related to formation of abscess where we give the, the drug. So that is something that will not happen in human because in human is to appeal. So now, this is why we have the data only in 12 hours right now. Now, since we saw the formation of abscess, we have done a testing and we found basically a way to use the Venclex, I call the real drug that people with cancer take, and we are administering the pill uh, to, the, to the animal. So for now, it's been safe, 
and we did not see any uh, main complication. And then just one more quickly. Yeah. Uh, are there more, I think this question is asking, is the latent virus more in one organ than another? A good good question. So there is some organ that are uh, considered to be key where the virus persists. One is the lymph node. This is why we are collecting them longitudinally. Because the lymph node is where a lot of uh, CD4 reside and where the antigen, like if there is a virus or bacteria, is, is usually presented to our immune system. Uh, and then also the gut is considered an important uh, reservoir. And there is also a lot of study on brain is less well characterized because, of course, it's very difficult to, to study brain in people and also in a primate. It's not that we can do longitudinal collection, we can collect only in necropsy, but also brain is considered an important reservoir. Okay. And then one more, how many animals have died using this method? So I guess more broadly than just this specifically. How many animals have died? How, how many fatalities of uh, non-human primates have happened using this method in, in general, if you have an answer to that? So with, with this study, any in general, in my career, that have probably infected more than 300 animals, I think we've been forced to sacrifice one for, for side effect. And I cannot comment for other people's study. So we have a very strict, uh, we are a, a non-human primate center regulated very strictly by a agency. So we have what is called the IACAC, that is the equivalent of the IRB for clinical trial. So our protocol need to be all approved by this IACAC, including a lot of veterinarian that serve there. And uh, if there is a complications at the fact, we need to report and we need, we need to follow their recommendation. They can ask us, you need to stop the treatment. They can ask us, you need to reduce the dose, or they can ask us, you need to release the animal or sacrifice the animal if it is softened. So this is really strictly regulated. So to clarify, all, all non-human primates are on some form of art, including the control group, correct? So correct. Yeah. no animals should be perishing from HIV exposure. Correct. Just to be sure, yeah, exactly. We are in the same condition. The control group are receiving antiretroviral therapy. The treatment group is receiving antiretroviral therapy, exactly the same, plus the venetoplax. Okay. And then there's another question. Have any studies been done on primate animals who have been infected for longer? With HIV in humans, there's often a delay between infection and diagnosis and thus the beginning of art treatment. And many individuals don't know exactly when they acquired it the way we do in primate models. Yeah, this, this is a great question. So this is our only study in which we start out so early, uh, two weeks post-infection. And this was uh, a specifically for the question we want to ask with this study, can we reduce the early establishment of the reservoir? Majority of our study, including the one that I'm going to show after this, where we do the intervention at art interruption to control the rebounding virus, we always start art later on, usually between six to eight weeks uh, after we infect the animal. So that is still, of course, shorter than a, a, a lot of people living with HIV, even if now there is a lot of push to start art early. And uh, the other difference is that we cannot mimic in the monkey model keeping on antiretroviral therapy for five years or six years. The point will no longer be a preclinical study. They need to inform a clinical study. It right? will take like five years to complete. And the cost of the study to, to maintain the animal is very high. And also IACAC does not allow us to keep the animal for so long in receiving antiretroviral therapy every day, et cetera. But I will come to that with the second study. Okay, so to address one of the key questions that we, we ask, did we reduce the size of the reservoir? So this is the early time point, basically day 25, 10 days after we started the treatment. And I'm not going to the detail, but basically what we did, we isolated the CD40 cells from the blood of this animal, and then we look how many viruses inside the CD40 cells. So the blue are the control, 
And here I'm showing that if we take 1 million of CD4, there is approximately 20,000, uh, 12,000 of them that uh, contain virus. Now, if you look in the animal that receive venetoclax, if we take 1 million of those cells, there is actually only 5,000, so less than half that contain the virus. So we've been able to significantly reduce more than 50% the amount of cells harboring this virus. And the result is actually even more significant because venetoclax is in killing some of the C40 cells. So not only there is less virus inside CD4 cells, but there is less CD4 in general. So the impact is even bigger. So then, as I said, it's also very important to see, is this uh, maintained when we stop the treatment? So now when we look now at 180 days, so six months after the treatment or 294 days, so 10 months after the treatment, actually, uh, to, I need to say almost to our surprise because the treatment was very short, we still see a, a very significant reduction. So as you can see, the scale is different, right? So also the control, because these animals receive antiretroviral therapy, the reservoir is reduced, go from 12,000 to like 600. But still in the animal that receive venetoclax remain significantly lower, again, almost more than half, despite now we are 10 months after the last dose of venetoclax. So this to us is, I think, very exciting, showing that we can reduce the reservoir and this reduction seems to be sustained. As I said, for now, it's only in a subset of animals, so we need to confirm this in a larger set of animals. And this is what is happening right now. The, the other thing that I want to show that I think explain, let me see, what time is it? Yeah, explain why there is this virus is uh, so complicated and there is a lot of challenge. So first of all, we want to prove that uh, the drug that you use is really doing what it's supposed to do, right? So it's very important to prove the mechanism of action of what we are testing. So I'm showing here the level of the CD40 cells. So if, if we are killing the cells where the virus persists, we should see a reduction in the number of CD40 cells. And indeed, we are showing that the level C40 cells in the animal received venetoclax is significantly lower than the control. So then the other uh, proof that our intervention worked, but also complication is showing this picture. So here I'm showing the level of this protein that we are targeting, that as I said before, is called BCL2. So this is a scale of how much of this protein is present in a cell. So going from few of the protein is white and a lot of the protein is red. So if you see in the control group that only receive up between day 14 and day 25, almost nothing happened. If you now see in the animal that receive venetoclax, at day 25, there is actually very high level of this protein. So this is a proof of concept. We are doing what we are supposed to do. So our drug eliminated the cells that express BCL2 but also prove that there is a mechanism of resistance from cells. So there is some cell that have so much high level of BCL2 that we are not able to eliminate. So this suggests we need to do something else because venetoclax by itself is not able to eliminate BCL2 because they have so much, so much level. And the other thing that I want to show you is, and then go back one second, as I mentioned, you have the mechanism, BCL2 bind these two proteins that should induce cell death, right? If you see here, there is other two proteins, and just focus on this uh, one, BCL, XL, that uh, can do exactly the same thing. So BCL2 is not the only protein that can favor cell survival. These are all very complex mechanisms. So there is another protein called BSL XL that can do the same, but usually it's less expressed. So BSL2 is the main target also for cancer. So now, if you go back to our cells that survive, so the one that we are not able to eliminate, despite they may have virus, if we look after the treatment, they also increase the level of BSL XL. So we eliminate the BSL2, these cells that we are not able to eliminate, have high level of BCL2 and also increase, since we target BCL2, bring even more of the protein that can still favor the survival. So this is 
very interesting for us because suggest we may be able to target both B cell two and B cell XL and really eliminate a very large fraction of the reservoir, but also prove how complicated is the immune system. There is always a lot of pathway regulating each other. So with that, I will just take five minutes for I think some very exciting result. This was the part that I said we it's very exciting, but uh, also associated with some toxicity. So this is a study that uh, coming more to the to the question of starting art later. So this is a study in which the animal have been infected. They start art, as you see here in this cartoon, at six weeks after infection. And then the animal remain on art for 77 weeks. So this is more than one year on art. So more similar to, uh, to what we have what in people uh, with HIV on antiretroviral therapy. So we have eight animals that are controlled. So they only receive antiretroviral therapy. And a eight animals that receive one antibody that block IL-10. But the one I want you to focus is the blue animal they receive two antibodies, one that block L10 and one that block PD-1. So IL-10 and PD-1 are two proteins that are called break of the immune system. You don't want your immune system always be activated because then can induce autoimmune disease or potentially cause damage to your tissue. But there is conditioning want, you want your immune system to be active to kill cancer cell or infected cell. So in cancer, again, there is a lot of interest in uh, using this antibody that remove this break like PD-1 L10. So your immune system now is superior in killing the cancer cells. Here we tested the same concept. Can we, by removing this break, having our immune system better in killing the infected cells? And as you can see here, we stop antiretroviral therapy and we give in these antibodies. So Without art, can we kill the infected cells by the immune system alone? And the virus is now under control. So, and these are the results. So this is the entire course of the study. So as I said before, when we infected the animal, they receive very high level of viral load. This is more than 10,000 copy. Then we start antiretroviral therapy. You don't see well here, but it's in gray. And of course, the animal became undetectable. So plasma viral load go lower than uh, our limit of detection monkeys, 15 copies. So they became undetectable. When you stop antiretroviral therapy, as I said, as in human, the macaques is a great model. See the black that are the control. Very large majority of them in this study, nine out of 10, basically uh, rebound at very high level. So mimicking what happened to people with HIV. However, when we use the two antibody, anti L10 and anti PD1, and again, these are not targeting the virus, these are targeting the immune system. So we are training the immune system to kill the infected cells. So 90% of our animal, nine out of 10, there was one animal that did not respond, are now able to control viral load to a very lower level, less than a thousand copies, like four, like uh, 10,000 uh, times lower than the control. So this has been in this model of with using this virus that is highly pathogenic, I think is unprecedented. We and other in the field never see this level of control. In I want to show, a, this is a, a picture of my student when presented this study to a conference. And this is a comment from a, a very well-known clinician in the field of HIV cure, Steve Dix, saying uh, in an interview, this is a rem and he was not involved in the study, this is a remarkably low level of viral load. People in our field find this very exciting that they were able to actually move the DL on such a tough model. So we are very excited about this intervention and we are developing further study as part of ARIS HIV. However, as I said, uh, this is not ready to go to human, unfortunately. So we do see a side effect. Remember, I said we are removing to break to make our immune system stronger against the virus, but there is a reason why the immune system have the break, right? If the immune system is too much activated, that can induce some side effect, uh, largely related to autoimmune, for example, kind of a side effect. Indeed, in our animal, we do see in some of them a side effect at mucosal sites, including erythema, gengiv gengivitis, or ulcers in the in the mouth. So 
We are really doing a lot of work and this is in collaboration with the Merck that has been generating for us this antibody to try to uh, reduce the dose or reduce the design of the antibody to hopefully maintain the same efficacy but reducing toxicity. So this is really a key part of our program. You two things, Mark. First, um, is this is this you saying that we've demonstrated some viral control without art? Correct. Yes. Yeah. So let me go back. Yeah. So this, I, I you you don't I don't know why it's not clear, but this there is a gray box, but this is the dotted line when we stop art. So this is called ATI art treatment interruption. So we do no longer give art to the animal. And as you can see, for example, the control the virus was less than uh, 15 copies in plasma. Now, like two weeks later, is a uh, uh, 10 to the 6. So this is a 1 million copy. So if you don't give art, since there is the reservoir, the virus starts to replicate and come back. In the animal that received the treatment, come back. So we did not delay the rebound. Come back is lower, but come back. But then the immune system is now ready to fight those cells that produce the virus and to kill them. So now the virus go down to very, very low level. So this is all without antiretroviral therapy. And actually, next slide will explain you even better. So as I said, one issue is safety. The other issue is that we've been able to control this virus for six months. So everything I show you in this graph here was for 24 weeks after art interruption, so six months without art. We we want, this was not even budget, but we want to address the question. We actually end up with a deficit and got extra funds. We want to ask, can we, is this control maintained for very, very long term, right? Or the animal and, for example, future people will need to go back to antiretroviral therapy. So we follow this animal for another, uh, for basically more, uh, close to one year after that interruption. So, as I told you, nine out of ten animals were controlled, and this animal was never controlled. So, now when we go much longer, three animals they were controlling, they do no longer control. They come back to a viral load that is similar to the control. Three animals they were controlling, they lost control, but they maintain a much lower viral load, around a thousand copies. So, this will still see significant results. And three animals were controlling viral load for more than 10 months without antiretroviral therapy. So this is exciting. It's actually some prolonged control in some of the animals, but also is showing, as I show here, that we lose control in some of the animals. So we also need to do better intervention to be sure that this is a long-term control. But again, these are all challenges, but this is really, at today, a, a, an unprecedented result. So I think very exciting with some significant challenge and listed in these slides. Okay, we have so, quite a few more questions. Yeah, we're... okay. Do you want me to go to the, this is the last slide and then we can- Oh, sure, yeah, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, so I just want, uh, yeah, as a take-home message that uh, I hope I, I convince you that the non-human primate are a great model for study of HIV, including uh, HIV cure studies. And as I said, give several advantages, including the ability to control for many variables that are difficult to control on uh, people living with HIV, including which virus uh, we use, when you start antiretroviral therapy, etc. And also allow us to look extensively, longitudinally, and also in tissues. I think exciting as part of our HIV, we have two interventions, one that we did at ART initiation, then can reduce the reservoir. Another one that we did at heart interruption that can better control the virus of rebound. So now, if we solve problem related to toxicity, ideally, we should combine both interventions. So now you, you can have a scenario in which you reduce the reservoir early on. So then when you stop heart, you already start with a much lower reservoir, and now you make your immune system stronger to control it. So really may have a strong impact. Uh, but as you can see in the, the last dotted point, I think these are a combined intervention, complicated intervention. They have a, a, there is a lot of excitement for this intervention in cancer because the majority of these people in which are tested have a very short uh, prognosis for the next five years. 
But of course, we, due to the great success of antiretroviral therapy, for having this strategy accepted by the uh, by people living with HIV, uh, we really need to be sure that not only they are very effective in uh, uh, controlling the virus, but also they need to be very safe. And this is the part where there is, a, I think, a very important work to do. So with that, I want to just acknowledge people in my lab that has been leading this study, all collaborator of uh, RSHV, and really my uh, partner, Diana and Guido, Barbara that is here with us, and our uh, uh, program manager, and Nadine, Perry, and Dazon, and everybody, Sister Love, for their collaboration and uh, for giving us this opportunity to, to interact with the community. And thank you guys for, for your attention. Thank you. So I'll start reading some of these questions in the chat, but yeah. also everyone feel free to unmute if you wanna ask directly. We want this to be a dialogue, a conversation, um, but I'll just start with what's in there so far. I believe the first question is asking, at this stage, can the non-human primates pass the virus to another non-human primate? Uh, so if when they are uh, infected without antiretroviral therapy, so for those few weeks, the animal are single cage because they can pass virus to, to another animal. So when they are on antiretroviral therapy is uh, similar to what has been shown for human with uh, U equal U, right? Undetectable, equal, and transmittable. If the animal are on antiretroviral therapy, they will not... Uh, transmit to another animal, also because all the animals are on antiretroviral therapy. So in that phase, the animals are uh, co-caged. Okay. And then the next question is, is there a study targeting BCL-XL planned yet? Yes. So there are study in vitro, and actually uh, Diana is doing some of the study because there are some compounds specific for BCL-XL. And this is a great question. And indeed, what Diane is trying to understand, can we, what is the result if you only block BCL2, if you only block BCL XL, and if you put together. So for this, Diane is taking cells from a non-human primate or from people, uh, infecting the cells directly in the Petri dish, and then address this question. Unfortunately, this compound that can be used just in cells in the in vitro in petri dish are not safe to be administered in a non-human primate. So there is a lot of effort for a, a specific in cancer to design a drugs that block BCL XL uh, safely. So if that drug will become available, we are really interested to test that concept. Based on our data, that may really be a potent combination. There, there are also a few drugs that, so like when Mirka was mentioning venetoclax, which is very specific for BCL2, there are some other compounds that are more broad in terms of being able to target like a single drug targeting multiple members of the same family. So we're very interested in drugs like those that could potentially with, instead of having to take multiple drugs, you have one drug that can target BCL2, BCL, XL, and other members that so you can maybe get all of them with one shot. And then was the one macaque that did not respond to the antibody blockade studied to potentially discover why they didn't respond to the therapy? Yes, so actually the animal uh, respond to the therapy in a way that we have a marker to be sure uh, the antibody does what they're supposed to do, right? So for example, uh, the antibody that block IL-10 we can measure how much L10 is in the plasma. We can measure, if we are blocking the L10, the L10 will not bind on the L10 receptor, so there is not going to be a signaling, right? So we can see if the antibody are working. So the antibody were working in that animal exactly like in the other nine animals. So it's not just there was something strange, the antibody did not work. Despite that, that animal did not control. One thing that was unique of that animal I, I cannot comment too much because it's one, but that time it was the animal that was having the highest viral load months before, before we start antiretroviral therapy. So that may have been an animal which was very difficult to control the virus because for some reason, maybe genetic, we don't know, that time it was having a very 
high var low the highest of all the animals we have in the study. And then are you only doing this in non-human primate models or are you using mouse models as well or has that been done? So the the others, what I think is a very good uh, um, organization of the RSHV, and for people that are less familiar, this is a collaboratory with up to 14 different institutions. Uh, is that, uh, again, there is many, many investigators. So what we are trying to do is to basically having, going from Diana, that tests a lot of this potential intervention in, as I said, what is called in vitro models so of taking cells. Then we have a two PI, one is a Priti Kumar and one is Victor Garcia that are expert in the humanized mouse model. And then we have a, me that lead the majority of the non-human primate study. So for example, if Diana will prove that uh, this drug the target also BSL-XL is working, in the cell system, then we'll go, before going to the macaques, we will go to the uh, mouse model because it's a shorter model, simple, less expensive. Uh, so we'll test there. And if it work, we'll then escalate to the non-human private work. And of course, if work and it's safe, then the idea is that you can escalate to, to human. So I don't do personally in our lab, but there is a, a mouse work as part of the RSHV program. And then I guess the second part of that question was, is there a difference in the outcome uh, based on which model is used? So I guess we should have a mouse person because <laughs> of course I'm, I'm, I'm biased, but I try to be as, as honest as possible. So the, the humanized mouse model has several advantages. One, since these are mouse that are reconstituted with human cells, you can use HIV, right? So you can use exactly the same virus that is on people linked with HIV. In monkey, we need to use SAB, that is a very close relative, but it's not HIV. So that is one of the key advantages of the mouse study. And as I said, are much less expensive. The complication of the mouse study is that the since they are reconstituted with human cells, the structure of the tissue is not as complex as you have in human or in non-human primate. So as I said before, a lot of virus persist in tissue, like in lymphoid tissue, in the gut. Uh, some of the cells that need to kill the virus, including the CD8, sometimes are not able, actually often are not able to infiltrate this tissue. Uh, so some of this complexity is not represented in the humanized mouse model. So I will say it's a very good model to initial screening, but is a lower bar, is easier to get a positive result in the humanized mice than in non human primate and, and then in human. So this is why I think it's very important to do this like a step-by-step -step approach. Thank you. If anyone else has questions, please feel free to raise your hand or unmute and ask. I know some people might have to hop off right at two. So while you're doing that, I'm just going to send a quick closing poll with a couple of questions. And then also, I'm going to drop the flyer in the chat for our community advisory board if you're interested in joining or know anyone who is. Let me put that in right now. Okay. And my email should be on there if you need any further information. But Go ahead, if anyone has any further questions, please feel free to unmute. In the meantime, I want to say thank you for organizing these. And uh, as, as we discussed many times, we are always available to, to have this discussion. So if in the future you guys are interested in I don't know, the area that uh, Diane is exploring, or we can invite somebody work in the mouse model if you're interested. So we are really uh, happy to, to, to have these a, a in-person conversation. Much appreciated. Okay. So, Hari, could you just share that lovely flyer on screen so we could capture that QR? It's real tiny on mine. That's why. I'm... Yes. Can you see that? Much better. Yes. Thank you. And thank you, Mirko, Deanna. This is great. Thank you, Dizon. Yeah, this is great. And uh, yeah, we are happy to, again, to do it. We, 
when we have intervention that work uh, in the human primate, we are happy to share and having feedback on what what will be acceptable for the community in term in terms of, of a cure. Absolutely. We have one in the chat actually before you go. How long do you think it would take for a human treatment to become available if these primate models continue to be effective? Yes, so wait, I'm still wait, wait a second. I lost oh, where is that? Oh yeah, sorry, I lost the wind the zoom window. <laughs> So I would have say if, if you ask me this before COVID, I would have say a significant amount of years. But I think with COVID, really there's been a, a for one of the first time showing the possibility that we can actually translate a relatively rapidly to from a preclinical model to to clinic. As I said, I think the key. The key question to me, the key point that dictate along the stake is is the safety. If something is working well and is safe, I think will not take longer. Uh, we are so lucky to have antiretroviral therapy that works so well that uh, uh, make a uh, more complicated the translation of some of these cure uh, clinical trial. A cure intervention to clinical trial because again we must be sure that they are very safe because the uh, antiretroviral therapy is now doing an amazing job so we always need to to be at that level. This is why is uh, actually many of these interventions have been easily translated in cancer because again in that case uh, some of these side effects are well accepted because the alternative is that some of these people may die for the cancer, right? So the the bar is very different between between the two the two uh, disease. Okay, it looks like that's all the questions in the chat. I'm gonna also drop my email in case anyone has any questions or wants to be connected or know any more information. But thank you so much, Mirko and Deanna and Barbara and everyone for joining. This was really engaging been a really cool experience thank you so much thank bye you. everyone more bye. to come yes bye bye bye, bye. bye.